the more risk you are going to increase your labor. So you don't want to do it too soon or too late. You want to make sure it's just the right time. Okay. Alpha feed of protein. Everybody understand alpha feed of protein? Where is it produced? <laughs> Okay, alpha feed protein <laughs> is produced by the fetal liver. It is produced by the fetal liver. So what does that tell me? The liver has to be formed and working, okay, before you can get an alpha feed protein test. All right, formed by the patient, the fetus's liver. Um, it screens for neural tube defects, and you can only do that between week 15 and 22. Now, a better test, the better of the two tests, is a triple marker test. Did you talk about that? No. Okay, triple marker tests are done at 10 weeks. That is a specific time. But the good thing about this, I would, I would always tell a patient, you want to do the triple marker, not just the plain old AFP, because it uses three different things. So it uses the alpha feed of protein, and that's maternal serum alpha feed of protein. Let me tell you this, alpha feed of protein is a substance produced by the fetal liver, but it's excreted into the woman's system, the woman's serum. That's how you test it. Okay, so that's how you know how much alpha feed of protein is being produced. Everybody got that? Fetal blood, blood draw. Fetal blood draw. Fetal blood draw. It's excreted into the woman's bloodstream. Okay, it's a substance that's produced by the fetal liver. So, so for example, if I drew one on Brittany right now, you're not pregnant, are you? Okay, so Brittany is not prego, so we drew one on her, and she shouldn't have alpha theta protein in her bloodstream, right? Because she doesn't have a fetus growing. Make sense? So, maternal, these are blood draws. Uses that. It also they draw for an estrogen level, estriol estrogen levels, and they draw an HCG level, and then they look at all those to see if they're within normal range, and they also look at how old the person is. So they look at all those things. So you see why that would be more accurate than just a plain old AFP. Would you rather have that done? I would rather have the more accurate test done. The problem with a triple marker screen, has anybody ever had one done? Yeah. The problem with a triple marker screen is that they're very expensive. And some insurances don't cover it unless there is, if they show, can show need for it. So that's the only drawback, is that they are expensive. But again, now, now again, okay, let me tell you this though. Let's think about this. So the mama comes in and she hadn't been in for her prenatal appointment and it's 14, so it's 18 weeks and she's just now hauling her little happy self in. And we know that she, we need to check for neural tube defect because she has a history in her family of Downs or she is 42 years old, which God help me if I have a right now. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but let's say she's just now dragging her happy little self in and she is 18 weeks. We can't do that triple marker now, can we? So now the only option we have is the regular alpha beta protein. Depends on when you get a hold of her. Okay, this kind of goes along with what we talked about. I want you to remember this. Remember we talked about non stress tests and contraction stress tests, right? Non stress tests. They are just laying out on the table. You hook them up to the monitor. Nothing. You're not doing anything to them. They're watching TV. They're just having themselves a good old time. But you're monitoring the condition of the baby. Okay. A non-reactive, non-stress test is not good. Think about that. All the ends. Non-reactive, non-stress test is not good because what that's telling me is that even though she's just laying there watching TV. What should the baby be doing? He should be flipping and flopping and moving and shaking and sucking on his foot and doing all these things. And that, I should be able to see accelerations on my monitor when he's doing those things, right? That is why, has anybody seen a non-stress test done at the hospital? That is why they come in at a specific time of day and sometimes they jack them up on caffeine before they come in. 
because they want to get a good reading. Otherwise, they may be there for for a whole 24 hours before they even get a reading, before an accurate good reading. So a non-reactive, non-stress test is not good. That tells me that the baby is not, has, we don't see any movement, any acceleration at all. Everybody got that? A reactive non-stress test is wonderful because I, what I'm seeing now is that every time baby flips and walks around, I'm seeing that heart rate go up on the monitor. And that's a good thing. Right? Do you look like this yet? <laughs> Are we okay? So far, so good. Okay. All right, a contraction stress test. Remember that the contraction stress test is a little different. What have I done now? I've added in an, a stressful experience, the contraction. I've done it, so I've, so I've brought them in, I lay them out on the stretch or a bed, and I hook them up to the monitor. I either give them Pitocin to start contractions, or I get them to stimulate their nipples, yeah, to get a contraction, something to get a contraction because we want to create the same environment that that baby is getting ready to go into. What would I not, when would I not want to bring them in to do this? Preterm. Before 30, yeah, before 32 weeks. I would say even before 28 weeks. You want to make sure that those lungs are good and mature because you may not get this stopped once you get it started. We hope we can stop the contractions, but we may not be able to get them stopped. So you don't want to do it too early. You can do the non-stress test anytime. Okay, as long as the baby's born with a newborn. A negative, and this is where people get this kind of backwards. Okay, a negative contraction stress test is what we want. Okay. Over here, we said a non-reactive, non-stress test is not good. So they use two different words. They use non-reactive or non-stress testing, and they use either negative or positive for contraction stress test. But a negative contraction stress test is good. That tells me that with every stress experience, every contraction, there are no decelerations. We talked about those just a minute ago, right? We don't want to see decelerations. We want to see, or if there are decelerations, they come right back up. Like those variables or those earlies, they come right back up. But we don't want to see any ominous signs of impending doom. Okay? A positive contraction stress test is bad. That's telling me that every time that baby is stressed, there is a deceleration bad deceleration and it takes a long time for it to come back up. Okay? Do they do that with everybody or is there just reasons why just they would do that? There's a reason. What would be? Uh, decreased fetal movement. Like all of a sudden at 37 weeks you say, I just had no baby movement in a long time. Or um, maybe there's a, a slight abruption and they want to see if that if it continues to abrupt, that can we deliver you? I want to see how that baby's going to do. So something's wrong. Did you? Right, the Pitocin or the nipple stimulation or something like that. When do you do, like, from the non reactive non stress You can do those at any time. Any time you can do those. Um, because you're not doing anything, you're not hurting the baby. Now, of course, I I would not bring a mother in that's too early that can't recognize baby movement yet either. You know, because we want to know that she knows what's going on. So we want to know that the baby is flipping and walking around. So I wouldn't do it too early. Maybe like um, 20 weeks. I, you know, you can even do it further than that. Maybe before that, maybe 14 weeks. I don't want to give you a t an actual week. Just remember that she has to be aware that there's movement going on and the baby's formed enough to be moving around. You know, early on, you don't know that there's anything going on. It's just a little peanut in there. So you got to know that there's, you gotta, it's got to be able to pick up on it. <laughs> now, there was a chart in, because I do this stuff in the pregnancy unit. So 
that there was a chart that I used. I'm just put this up here. So I saw Katie. She's got this. She had a blank chart here. Um, if you can find that chart, print it out and, and practice filling some of this stuff in if you want to. It says assessing your fetal well being. Okay, I may have stuck it in there. No, you stuck it in there. That's where I put it on. Okay, good. Oh, well, that's hard to calculate. Now, there is on there ultrasound. Now, ultrasound, you know, that's just a common sense thing. You can really do ultrasound pretty much any time. But I'm not going to get, I'm not going to go into detail on, on all those different things like fetal anomaly and, and stuff like that because we've got plenty of other stuff to worry about. So, you know, ultrasound tells you a lot, though. It gives you a lot of information. All right. Good. Okay. Okay. All right, let's talk about. <coughs> I'm going to turn the PowerPoint back on. Is everybody good with this? I'm not going to raise it. I'm just going to Okay, so the first slide <clears throat> is another one of those 1940s motherhood things, and it talks about, it's getting ready to talk about the pain relief and all that stuff. It talks about when they would give them nitrous oxide. That one. Yeah. Uh, so ordinarily, anesthesia is given with each pain. Jesus. Throughout the, think how much anesthesia that means that person. Throughout the greater part of all this period, it must be remembered that the expulsion of the infant is brought about by the action of the abdominal respiratory muscles. In much the same way, the bowel movements accomplish the common practice is as follows. Here we go. The moment the patient feels the pain coming on, there are several seconds of warning. She takes three or four deep whiffs of the anesthetic, usually nitrous oxide, lasting gas, closes her lips, holds her breath, and strains down. Meanwhile, the anesthetic is taking effect and she carries out the desired procedure, although she's unconscious of it. At the moment of birth, as the moment of birth approaches, the anesthesia is deepened so that the patient is quite unconscious at this time and for a few minutes afterwards. That's when you wake up and here's your baby and you're good. Yes, they did do that. And there were babies that were so depressed, respiratory depression is a miracle everybody survived. So, um, that's the only drawback, of course, to all this. Yes. The lactic gas, they give it a lot of times for dental procedures. Okay. So, let's talk about non-pharmacologic pain relief, so things that we can do to relieve pain during our labor. So, you've got, of course, breathing techniques. Should you encourage them to hold their breath? No. No, you should never encourage them to hold their breath. Um, what does that do? Why do you... Called non-glottal glottis breath holding. What does it do? You pass out for one thing because you're not getting enough oxygen. So you always should breathe, teaching them to breathe between contractions. Don't hold their breath and bear down. It's not a good thing. Um, Effleurage, that is a, a feather-like massage that you can teach 
the partner where they just take their fingers and they just gently just feather across the abdomen as it contracts. Yes, I mean, a lot of people would just slap the person who's trying to do that, but that is one way of doing that. Um, counter pressure is really good if you've got somebody who's having back labor, because remember we talked about the, the posterior position of the baby. Remember the ROP or LOP, the baby's turned backwards. It causes a lot of back labor. You can actually use your fist in their back to just try to relax them, or you can um, take a tennis ball and run it up and down their back just for counter pressure. It just hopefully relieve some of that aching. Water therapy, there are some places where you can actually still get in a tub to deliver your baby. Um, now, that is not your own bathroom tub. Those tubs are specially cleaned with special stuff so that your baby's not born into the disgust. Um, so there are, and actually, uh, there are some places that'll bring like a portable, inflatable baby pool. Honestly, it's what it looks like, a baby pool. And you get in the baby pool and you just float around. Um, acupressure, again, it's similar to counter pressure. Um, application of heat and cold, therapeutic touch, and those, and you know, honestly, you have to buy into this stuff, right? You have to be able to buy into this stuff for it to work. I worked with a lady several years ago um, who taught with us, and she said that for both of her children, she went to a hypnotherapist before she delivered, and he would, he taught her how to, I don't know how you do this, but he taught her how to self-hypnotize so that she, um, she hypnotized herself before she delivered. I don't know what she did, so. But these are just some things that you may see people trying some different ways to just relieve that pain. Here's shower. Here's somebody getting um, water therapy, the shower, <laughs> the relaxes. Okay, now let's talk about, I've got three little YouTube clips for us to look at. We're going to talk about positioning. The first thing we're going to talk about is natural birth, women who decide not to use medication. This is um, Lamaze. There's a method called the Bradley method. Um, these are husband or partner coach methods. You can take a class on how to do this. Um, yeah, so let me just show you. for midwifery at the University of Colorado Hospital. Today I am talking to you about the second stage of labor and pushing. This is a position utilized for pushing sometimes for women without an epidural. Um, for women who don't quite find strength with the squat, some women will just feel grounded and um, with their feet planted and their knees straight, where they can drop their pelvic bone um, out or they can quickly um, convert this position into a squatting position. The squat bar can be used for support in many different ways throughout labor and pushing. This is just yet another way to um, use it for strength and to support your body when you're bearing down. Here's another position for pushing um, with an unmedicated birth one knee on the bed and one knee standing on the ground. This position is um, also very similar to a squat. Many women actually feel more comfortable in labor and while pushing um, sitting on a toilet uh, because there's no pressure against their perineum. It's open. So leaning forward allows access to a laboring woman's back to provide massage. So you can provide counter pressure, massaging the legs and the thigh. Some women feel more comfortable leaning forward and utilizing the bar um, for strength and support. And some women actually will lie back against their partner. <laughs> will lie back against their partner to push um, or to relax in between contractions and, and rest. 
I'm going to show you how a woman with an epidural can utilize a squat bar while pushing. It does require um, some testing out her legs first. Some women feel that they've got great um, motor function and the ability to move their legs around, but once they're actually standing up on their feet, you have to feel it out and make sure that it is a comfortable and safe position for you. Therefore, none of these positions should be done alone. You should always have the, assistant, the assistance of um, a minimum of two people. Once you start feeling a, a contraction beginning, or if your support people can identify on um, the fetal monitor that a contraction is, is beginning, you'll want to get in your position of squatting. You'll want to start to scoot forward and you're going to use the strength of your own body, either your forearms, your hands, and you're going to lift up and hang. And then you're basically going to hang off the bar into a squat position. Most importantly, you want to make sure that you're using your feet for support. Women will need assistance into this position, and then after the contraction, they'll need assistance out of this position. You do not want to stay in this position for too long because you can cut off the circulation to your feet. Another way to utilize the squat bar is um, a place to put your feet down when you are in more of a reclining position. Women with epidurals sometimes don't have a lot of control of their, um, their legs and they don't have as much stability in their hip joints. So their legs sometimes can flop out. It's always a good idea to put a support person on either side of their legs to make sure that the, the legs don't fall out too far and um, cause any nerve damage. Another way to utilize the squat bar with an epidural with pushing is um, using the method of the push-pull. You can tie a sheet around the squat bar, make a knot at the end of it, and a woman can use the traction of her own body. This is the push-pull, and um, you can actually utilize your own body and the traction that exists between your feet pushing on the bar and that your arms pulling. It's a good idea to, to utilize your elbow and curl up your back around your body. It's always great when you, with or without an epidural, to change positions with pushing. One um, position that women enjoy when they have an epidural is pushing on their side. The way that you do that is you roll over onto your side and then you can have someone support your upper leg while pushing. Your job as a support person is mainly just to assist the woman to maintain this hold so they don't have to utilize unnecessary energy. You think that you can help her push her baby out by um, flexing her, her legs. Because she um, has less sensation due to the epidural, she's not going to feel if you're damaging any aspect of her upper, um, upper leg and, and hip joint. Hands and knees is a wonderful position, even with an epidural. So while you're changing into different positions, you have to be very conscious of how you feel, how strong your legs feel, and the support people around you um, and their ability to get you into these various positions safely. So when you're getting to hands and knees position with an epidural, it is a good idea to have the bed, um, the back of the bed slightly elevated. And that way a woman can get a little more traction and use the bed for support as they are rolling onto their hands and knees. So again, you want to um, see how much of the position change a woman can actually do on her own. That also prevents injury for the woman as well as the support person. Go onto your knees gently. Sometimes they need help with that lower leg. And then they're gonna sort of walk their way up to the head of the bed. Very important that the knees stay wide in the pelvis for your baby to rotate through. And they can either utilize the weight on their hands, or they like to use their forearms. Sometimes they 
prefer to have the bed, the back of the bed up really high, this is still considered a hands and knees position. This is a nice one to be able to rest in between contractions. Now, what did you notice about a lot of those positions? Thank you. Because we're going to talk about, in just a minute, one of the worst things that modern medicine has ever done to a woman in labor is stick her in a bed and stick those feet up and expect her to push that baby out against gravity. That is the worst thing that's ever happened. And it, we are doing a detriment to these women when we bring them in and stick them up in stirrups. We are. There is no reason. And every time I teach this, everybody's like, you know, I never really thought about it, but it really is true. And you advocate for the patient. It may look odd, but it looks odd because nobody else is that nobody advocates for it. That's why we think of it as looking odd. But the more upright that person is, the better off they're going to be. Think about it back in the early days before hospitals were made. What did they do? They were out working, right? They squat, deliver their baby, and they go on. The squatting position is the way to go. Yeah, yeah. There's a reason for that, right? I mean, it makes sense. That baby is going to be helped down the birth canal. So do not allow yourself or your patients to be slapped into that lobotomy position. So any hospital will do that? Any hospital birth will do that. You just have to tell them. They will. They're supposed to do that. Yeah. And you advocate for them. You know, those things are not that difficult to do. Okay, the laundry might be mad at you because you tied a knot in their sheet, but other than that, those things are great. Do and they we have need squat bars use them. Huh? They have squat bars? They do have squat bars. Now, they may be in the closet, but you're going to get them out, right? And you can use other things. I mean, you know, like she said, sitting on a toilet in between time and pushing, those are great things. If y'all watch the In the Womb, I love, I love showing that every year. What the lady at the end, I don't know if you really noticed this, but at the very end when she's delivering her baby, she is squatting. She is sitting on a birthing stool. Do you, because you, you remember they had to, they reached down to get the baby and then they had to bring her, bring the baby between her legs to get the baby up and the cord and everything. She was squatting. That's the easiest and you're going to have decreased tears and lacerations. There's not any for an epidural. It's common sense. Common sense. They don't like it because it's harder to see. It's harder to see. And so, exactly. But we as nurses know, right, we're not going to do that. Okay. Labor positions during the first stage. This is going to be a little similar, but a couple of little things different. Okay. Hi, my name is Jessica Anderson, and I'm a certified nurse midwife at the University of Colorado Hospital Center for Midwifery. Today, we're going to talk about birthing positions. There are many positions that you can utilize during the first stage of labor. One of the positions that you can use is a sideline position. This position is wonderful for early labor as it allows you to rest during the contractions. Often, women are able to get a little nap in between their contractions, um, and they're not, you, you don't use a lot of energy with this position. So it can be really beneficial in those early stages of labor. Another wonderful position is the hands and knees position. This is great for the first and also second stage of labor. For first stage of labor, it's nice for women who are having a significant back pain. Getting this position can help your baby rotate, and it also allows for your support person to give you some assistance with massage or pressure on your lower back. Another position that's really beneficial for the first stage of labor is standing. Typically, this is a position that women use in first stages of labor or the early stages of labor. It's nice because it can help promote progress in labor. It also can promote comfort and decrease pain. Typically, what women will do is they will stand, and then when they have a contraction come on, they will utilize a support person to almost do a type of slow dancing position. They will utilize this position during the contraction, and then we'll typically stand up when the contraction is over. Another wonderful position to utilize in the first stages of labor is walking. Walking can actually help promote progress in labor, and it can actually help your baby to get into a wonderful position to help the, the birthing and labor process. Walking is nice as women are able to walk, 
and then when they have a contraction come on, they can stop and do relaxation techniques to get through the contraction. Typically, walking is something that is used more in the early stages of labor. The sitting position is also a great position to utilize in the first stage of labor. There are several ways that you can use the sitting position. You can use a birth ball, a birth stool, you can sit on the side of a bed, and you can also use the bed at the hospitals um, to get in this type of position. This is wonderful as it allows women to rest between their contractions. Women can lay their head back in between, shut their eyes and get a little nap. It's also a great position as you utilize gravity to help your baby drop and settle into your pelvis into an optimal position. Another wonderful position to utilize in the first and second stages of labor is the squatting position. The squatting position is wonderful as it opens your pelvis and helps facil facilitate your baby getting into a wonderful position for birthing. The nice thing about the squatting position is that women are able to pull themselves up into a squatting position. They then push during their contraction and when they're finished pushing, they can sit back into a more supportive position to conserve their energy. Another position that you can utilize for the first and second stages of labor is an upright position on the birth stool. Birth stools are wonderful as they help gravity and help your baby settle into a wonderful position in your pelvis. It's also a position um, that you can utilize for pushing as well. This position is nice for pushing as it really helps you get a powerful push because you're in an upright position and it also allows the mom to be very involved in their birth. In the first stages of labor, the birth stool allows your support person to have access to your back if you're having a lot of back labor or pain. Your partner can give you pressure on your lower back or can also massage your lower back as well. The birth stool is something that can be utilized in the second stage of labor. Women are actually able to, give, to push and give birth in this position. If you're having a birth on a birth stool, your provider will typically be on the floor, like I am, and will support your perineum and assist your baby into the world. One thing that has been found for some women, particularly women having the first baby, you can have larger lacerations on the birth stool. So often, if you're having your first baby, your midwife or provider may suggest that you only push in this position and give birth in a different position. Like the last time I'll show you is the birthing ball, which I think the birthing ball is the ball. Hi, my name is Jessica Anderson, and I'm a certified nurse midwife at the University of Colorado Hospital Center for Midwifery. Today we're going to talk about birthing positions, and the first thing we're going to discuss is actually the use of the birth ball. The birth ball is, a, is something that you can utilize during your entire labor, something that can be used during early and also the active phases of labor. The nice thing about the ball is that there's many different positions that you can use, and it's also wonderful because it helps decrease the pain, it promotes comfort, it's wonderful if you're having back labor, and it also helps the baby get into the right position by utilizing gravity. One of the things to remember regarding safety with using the birth ball is that you want to have a support person around you so that you do not fall off the ball. Mm -hmm. You also want to make sure you get a ball that fits your, your height, and so that is something that you can look at the box when you're purchasing your exercise ball. When you're on the ball, you can use a rocking position from front to back, or you also can go from side to side as well. It's also really beneficial in between contractions, you can lay your head onto the pillow and you can get a little rest in between your contractions. One of the nice things to do for women when they're in labor is to put a little pressure in the lower back. This is particularly helpful if someone is having a lot of back labor. You can, just giving a gentle pressure during the contraction can be really helpful. The other thing you can do is between contractions is just give a little massage. And this is nice if you have um, some lotion or aromatherapy oil. It's going to be really helpful to, for women. There are different size of balls that you can use while you're laboring. We've already seen the larger ball that you can sit on. There's also another ball that's smaller that you can actually utilize on your hands and knees. This is a great position if you're tired. It allows you to rest between contractions. It allows your support person to really get in and do some support measures on your back. You can rock back and forth from front to back during the contractions. You can also go from side to side. And this also allows your support person to really push on your back if you're having back pain, or also provide massage as well. So 
sweet thing. Is it the greatest? Yeah. I don't think we get on board here. Those things are great. I mean, and what, so, you know, you think about why are we doing this to our patients? Why are we putting them in these positions that we don't need to? So, you be, your, you be the advocate for your patient and get some of this stuff out and use it. It, it is easier for the physician to put them up in the lobotomy position, but it's not easier for us. It's not easier for us. So, all right, so those are different positioning. And that YouTube channel is great if you want to look through some more good stuff. Okay, so this is what we talked about upright, which is gravity, all fours, release back eight, lobotomy is the usual, unfortunately. Semi recumbent, you just have to make sure it's up behind your back. And then she showed you sidelined with the leg up. That helps if you need to rotate the infant too. So here's, here's your stuff sideline in the birthing stool. Okay, how many of you have heard of a doula? Has anybody seen a doula in action? Okay, one person. All right, so a doula is somebody who is tra a trained support person. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't have any other support people, okay? You may have somebody else who's very supportive, but a doula is somebody who is trained in helping you give birth. They are not a midwife, okay? So it's not somebody who can actually deliver the baby, but it's somebody who gets paid, and they get paid a lot of money to go in and set up that room to make it easy for you to give birth. They have all these little tricks. They have the birthing ball. They have the uh, bath, the, the tub that you can sit in. Um, they'll string Christmas tree lights around your room if, if you want them to. They have aromatherapy, they're the ones who stand there and say, okay, let's go, we're going to push, um, you know, those, they're wonderful assistive personnel, but again, don't confuse them with the midwife, they're not a midwife, okay, so they're not responsible for delivering the baby, um, right, they're your cheerleader, okay. Um, this is a website that you can go to, and it shows you um, all the different things about doulas. I'm not going to read them to you, but if you're interested in knowing more about a doula, a couple of years ago, I actually had a doula that came and talked to the class, and she brought all the little stuff, so that was kind of cool. Um, but um, it's, it's interesting if you want to go and research it a little bit more for your patients. Doesn't have to be somebody who's replacing your husband or your partner or whoever. A lot it's just of somebody who's, who's helping. I'll say a lot of times, uh, massage therapy. My mom's a massage therapist. She has several friends who are double trained, and so they um, do a dual look. Yeah. And, um, they go middle of the night oh, yeah. whenever they're on. Whenever the they're needed. Whenever they're needed. So it's great, and they make a place and they make a lot of money. Okay. All right. Okay, so here is, we read this about inducing labor with the castor oil, right? We've already read that one, so I thought that was really interesting. Okay, here are some different painless labor methods from the 1940s. Uh, twilight sleep um, is similar to um, what we just talked about a minute ago, the nitrous oxide, they called it twilight sleep. Uh, barbiturates, they talked about barbiturates in that book, and they also talked about a thing, I thought this was interesting, called trialing, and they would put it in an inhaler, and they would put it in a mask, and they would attach the inhaler to a mask, and the mask would be attached to her wrist, and then she would take a whiff of this inhalant every time, kind of like the nitrous oxide, and then eventually she'd be totally knocked out, and the, and the, the inhaler just attaches the same room from her wrist. So it resembles chloroform, is what they say. Okay, let's talk about pain medicines and then we'll call it a day, okay? Talk about the different types of pain medicines. Um, my 
my thought process, I did not, well, I had a C-section, but my thought process is that God gave somebody the knowledge to make that girl, so we should use that. Right? Um, but there are people who don't want an epidural, so we're going to talk about the other types of pain medicines that are available. Um, narcotics are just a, a general form of medication. Let me flip to the page here. Here we go. Um, one of the most common narcotics that's used is Sadol. Okay, one of the most common narcotics that's used is Sadol. Uh, the biggest side effects, the biggest negatives about using Sadol, S-T-A-D-O-L, is that it causes respiratory depression in the fetus. Respiratory depression in the fetus. And it can also cause urinary retention in the mother. It is similar to morphine in that it doesn't last long. So it may only last them one to two hours. Since it's a narcotic, what if you accidentally either give them too much or you give them a dose of state all and you look at the monitor and that baby starts having some really deep decelerations with so Narcan. Narcan, right? You can give them Narcan and, re and reverse the narcotic. So if you notice on that fetal monitor that all of a sudden the baby don't look so good, it didn't like that state all, we got to do something about it. The next thing is a term that not a lot of people have heard of. It's called adoratic or analgesic potentiator. Used to, we would give, we would do this all the time. These are not pain medications. These are medications that are given with a pain medication to make it work better. When I first became a nurse, every time we would give Demerol, we would give Benergan. It was just like we would give it all the time, often in the same syringe. Um, and that is called an adoratic. So you're giving a medication such as Benergan, uh, Vistaril is one, which is an anti-anxiety. You're giving it in conjunction with a narcotic to potentiate, see that analgesic potentiator, to potentiate or make the drug more effective. They can, yeah, Benadryl is something that they will give, yeah, exactly, because it makes that work better, exactly, and that, 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 that process, giving a drug to make another drug work better, and, and the good thing is, is if you're giving them an anti-nausea medicine, for example, like Benadryl or Zofran, it's going to help them with nausea, too, right, so you're, you're, it's a double whammy. <coughs> Um, all right, an epidural. Has anybody gotten to see an epidural placed? Okay, nobody passed out, not everybody did good, okay. Um, we talked about the fact that you can have different types of epidurals depending on how far they numb down, right? Remember, you can numb all the way to the nose and be completely numb, or you can just numb down to your perineum and then you can walk, which is called walking epidural. Typically, the drug used in those are fentanyl, Fentanyl, which is F E T A N Y L, fentanyl. Um, they may use Demerol. So, and I want everybody to hear this because it's very important. Whenever you have an epidural or when you have a spinal block, which we're going to talk about in just a minute, you always, 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 always load them up with fluid, IV fluid, before the epidural. You give them a thousand cc bag of fluids because the biggest side effect of an epidural or a spinal block, spinal anesthesia, is that it will bottom out that blood pressure and you don't want that to happen. So you always give them big bolus of fluid before you do the epidural with the spinal block to make sure that their blood pressure holds.
what is the difference between an epidural and a spinal block or spinal anesthesia? The space, how much it goes in. The space that it goes in and a spinal block or spinal anesthesia is just one injection, one and done. And it lasts through the, the labor or through inspection and then it's gone. An epidural, you can have for hours. You can push the little button or it's, a, it's programmed by a pump to deliver a continuous amount of fluid or a medication. A spinal block is just one injection and you're done. So those typically are used for C-sections. And again, we talked about fluids. That's the biggest thing for fluids. A pudendal block, and this is a picture of a pudendal block. What they're doing is they're numbing the perineum. Those are given a, a lot for episiotomy and sometimes for the birth process. It relieves pain in that perineal area in the vulva. The problem with pudendal blocks is that they can cause a hematoma and it can if you don't hit it correctly cause trauma to the sciatic nerve that runs down through that area so if you've got somebody with sciatica this is probably not a good option for you right and if you if they inject it incorrectly you see how this person is injecting it towards the leg you see that if they go this way with the needle, it can cause a rectal perforation. I think my mom on the other one of the other. I have some mom about to look for it because she did not have an epidural. And she tore her uterus. <coughs> All in that area. The this moment is coming off this table. Yeah, worse than the birth. It, yeah, it was down for yeah. um, And then the last one is general anesthesia. It's not. It's rarely, rarely used anymore to knock somebody completely out. Um, now we were talking up here that there's a there's a, a study going on that Maine's trying to bring back nitrous oxide, which makes me nervous. But general anesthesia is very rarely used because of the fact that it has such a negative effect on the baby. Um, they come out practically not breathing at all because you just anesthetize them. Um, the only time that I personally have ever seen general anesthesia used is a patient with scoliosis where they couldn't get the curvature of the spinal so bad that they couldn't get an epidural or a spinal block in. Um, I work as a CNA on labor and delivery, and I've only seen one, and it was when the woman had a prolapse core, and they only had like five minutes. There you go. They had to get it out then. Yeah, exactly. And the baby so, was rough. Yeah. I mean, it's you're bagging and praying, and yeah. It's, it might not be me, but there is a pediatric hospital where there's our in right now, because I work for labor and delivery. And, and the more pieces come out. Like when the girls that are about to deliver are talking about how they want to try to get it before they birth. Oh, wow. Yeah, I work at Presby. I'm going to have to look that up. I'm going to try that out. Okay. All right. So these are some of the options. And, you know, again, you don't have to have any kind of pain medicine. A lot of women deliver without any pain medicine. They use that, that uh, all those different methods. I personally think that there's a reason we have those medications. <laughs> I mean, I think it would be a detriment to the person who created it. So, um, it's a disrespectful. All right, so tomorrow's clinical. So, Monday, we'll pick up where we left off. Uh, hopefully, all my stuff's packed back up my internal monitor, my internal fetal monitor, and all that stuff. I was like, oh. Seventeen and twenty eight, you have three to a plane.